when should the church speak to the state by the church I'm meaning God's people by the state I'm meaning the government um, so you know it it, it, it it engages a lot of things in that. Should we, do we speak into elections? Do we speak into uh, social issues that are uh, in the government's jurisdiction? Um, should, we, should we just basically live uh, acknowledging and recognizing that there is a government and separate from it? And how, how should we consider this? And this will be primarily focused around the topic that uh, has been of of a focal interest of mine uh, of the states here now for several months you know at first uh, if the church first was reminded of how atrocious um, the behavior is toward infants in the womb when New York the state of New York uh, the house the senate and the governor signed into law essentially an infanticide position that up to the point of while the baby is being delivered that a mother could choose to abort the life now it's interesting we use the word abort uh, in a logical procession here there's no reason to use the word abortion if you're not first of all acknowledging it is alive it is an illogical thing to call it that so the world has adopted a word they don't even know that they're saying that they are intentionally stopping life in the work of abortion. Uh, which, by the way, is one of the first arguments I brought to our city council about a month and a half ago. Whenever I, I, I went and looked at how does the Idaho Health and Welfare um, identify this um, and we, we keep record of it. We keep vital statistics about it. And uh, so in the definition of, of abortion is induced abortions is the actual phrase that the government uses to track this and to, and to record uh, what's, uh, what's going on with this. And induced means, it actually literally means to stop life. To in, induced abortions. So to use both of those words, it is an outside act that is imposed against another living being. So because we're using the word abortion, the government's using the word abortion, perhaps maybe even to their, to their lack of, of, of knowledge, and then to use the word induced in front of it literally means we are murdering. We are purposefully taking the life of another being. So now this may be the only time you'll ever hear me pull out the United Nations uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But I thought it would be interesting. You know, we've, we've tangoed with, uni with United Nations in days past as a church. And um, the United Nations does, I, I, think it, I think it would be fair to say that uh, we have, uh, we have a love-hate relationship with such an organization as this. In 1945, when the United Nations began, um, you know, I, I was nowhere around in that time, by the way, but you can read about the history of it, and it appears that there is at least a humanitarian desire to put together an organization that could speak to the whole of the world population in regards to how uh, humanity gets along with each other. Good or bad, Agree or disagree, that my, my point here is to certainly not to uh, try to persuade anybody to come into an agreement that the United Nations is a good thing. Uh, I think it's very clear, you've heard from me, I hold very skeptical views of the United Nations. I think it is more damage than good, and I think it is, um, it is essentially, for me, my observations and my knowledge and my, my very close hand-to-hand -hand dialogue in the United Nations and the UNICEF uh, uh, components of life that what we know as Planned Parenthood in the United States, UNICEF and United Nations is to the world. It, is, it has become one of its primary duties as world population control. And so that's surprising to a lot of people. Um, 
And, and if, uh, if I'm sharing something with you that perhaps is shocking to you, uh, I can say to you, all you need to do is go do a little bit of research on what UNICEF is, which is the United Nations Child Protective Services Organization. Um, and uh, just do a little bit of research on it, and you'll find that uh, one of the biggest things that they are engaged in is family planning. And uh, we know that that's a, uh, an oxymoron of a statement in the United States for Planned Parenthood to be engaged in family planning. It is the same true for UNICEF. So let me just let me just share a few things with you, and then I want to I want to obviously make the case out of Scripture, not from the preamble of the of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations, or my case I want to make from Scripture. But let's build the case for asking the question or getting to an answer to the question of when should the church speak to the state. So this is out of the preamble, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's about 17 pages long. I'm just going to read. Uh, about seven or eight lines or articles or phrases inside of it. This is the first paragraph. Says, Whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Now, that's going to become a pretty important phrase when you consider some of the other things that the the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations says. They, when they make claim that this is, they're speaking to the equal and the inalienable rights of all members of the human family. That's critical. Uh, we've, we've known this for a long time. Places like Idaho, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, Iowa, uh, Kentucky. Um, I think there's like 20 plus states that have a similar code in, uh, that, that was in place even before Roe v. Wade in the 1970s was in place, and that was it identified the fetus in the womb of a woman as a person, as a human person. So that language is pretty critical. Um, further in the, in the preamble here, it says... Uh, Whereas the peoples of the, United, of the United Nations have in the charter reaffirmed their faith in fundamental, now their use of the word faith is not spiritual, just their faith in the fundamental human rights. In the dignity and the worth of the human person and in the equal rights, and, and in their equal rights, determined to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. And by the way, I, th I think it would serve you well to go home at some point, um, you know, keep a nice cold glass of ice water close by because every now and then you're going to need to take a drink to cool down. Cool, cool your, your, your internal engines whenever you read uh, the larger document of the preamble of the Un Universal Declaration of Human Rights. He, it, it, it further states, remember this is being written in 1945, uh, this following the charter of the United Nations, Nations, which lays out basically a universal attempt to uh, write a declaration of independence for all nations to be united together. It's, it's a pretty bizarre document. Um, so now, therefore, the General Assembly proclaims a universal declaration of human rights as a common standard of achievement, of, of achievement for all peoples and all nations. So already twice now, after the first paragraph of speaking of the, of the members of the human family, this is the fundamental right of every member of the human family, they're already speaking about persons and humans. They're not making dis distinctions about age or social class or ethnicity. They're not making any, class, any, any delineating differences of geographical location of any sort. They're just speaking about the general freedom of all of humanity. Article 1 says, All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Now, they do make that as an interesting uh, delineating difference in Article 1 where they say are born free. Um, but it's a, you'll find, if you 
study it closely and look at it in the words, they actually make the argument they don't necessarily mean born out of the womb. So that's it's a problematic phrase uh, from this uh, common observer when I look at the document. It says, they, these rites are endowed, which, by the way, that's a pretty spectacular statement. It means these rites are not theirs alone. They are given to them. They are endowed to them. Now, this document doesn't say who did the endowing, but it is still, nonetheless, an interesting statement. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. So the, dec- the article, our article 1 of the Declaration is saying all humans ought to treat all humans with respect. Article 2 says everyone is entitled to all the rights of freedoms set forth in this Declaration without distinction of any kind such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. Every word has to mean something. What other kind of status might they be meaning? Well, it could mean a lot of... I mean, they've just laid out very specific statuses. And then they use the word status in general. Article 3 says everyone, that's all it says, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. Well, that's a pretty straightforward. I like that article. Everyone has the right to life. Article 6, perhaps the most straightforward of, of these articles. Everyone has a right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. I'll read that again because I think I butchered it. Everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. Everyone has a right to be recognized as a person. Well, Article 6 says, No one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest, detention, or exile. Now, that has nothing to do with this. I just thought that was interesting, Steve. The United Nations says no one has the right to arrest us arbitrarily. <laughs> but they did. Okay, yeah, that has nothing to do with this. So. Article 11 has nothing to do with human rights, but, it, but Steve, I, I thought it of interest here for you and I, for Silas. And everyone charged with a penal offense has the right to be presumed innocent. (laughs) Okay, I'm getting too personal now, aren't I? I'm way off topic. Uh, Motherhood, this is Article 25. Motherhood and childhood are entitled to special care and assistance. All children, All children shall enjoy the same social protection. Now they do state here, born in or out of wedlock, um, which, is an, which is interesting, first of all, that they recognize marriage. Uh, if you used the dictionary in 1945 and you looked up the word marriage, it would be a man married to a woman. And then finally, Article six, Article 26, Paragraph 3. Parents have a prior right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children. I would say as time moves along, parents, you, you might want to remind governments of that statement. All right, this may be the last time I will ever make quoted references to the United Nations declarations of human rights. You're welcome. (laughs) But it's quite helpful whenever we begin to think about the larger question that's been in front of us as a state. It's really been in front of us as a nation. But certainly it's been in front of us as a state and really even before us as a church and even in our own city. 
So what I want to do before I, I bring up anything else here is let's go to the Word of God. Um, there won't be any surprises to you of anything that we'll read here of Scripture. Let's start in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. <clears throat> Verse 27 and following of chapter 1 says this, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, say it with me, male and female, he created them. Verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing. That moves on the earth go to the book of exodus chapter 21 when you get to the 21st chapter of exodus make way to the 22nd verse and follow along either in print or audibly listening if if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judge decide. The judges decide. Verse 23, But if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life, for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. You see what God has done here? Our Idaho code is actually based off of Exodus chapter 21. That if injury is done to the fetus in the womb of a woman, there, by law, it is required that the one who causes the injury should pay the penalties, should pay the, the damages done. Maybe the baby lives. I think our Idaho code would still require the one who caused injury, if injury were to happen, that the one who caused that injury would pay the medical expenses, uh, would pay any other uh, required uh, penalties that would come along with it. If the baby died, that individual would be charged according to law, according to murder. Not only if, if the mother died and the child died, Idaho Code charges two murders to the one who causes the injury. It's Exodus 21. Exodus 21 acknowledges and makes the pathway, the legal pathway, that the child in the womb is a person. Uh, Psalm chapter 139. It's a, it's a go-to chapter for, for all conversations related to life in the womb. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. For you formed my inward parts, and you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Isaiah chapter 44. In the 44th chapter of Isaiah, we'll look at the 24th verse. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the one who formed you in the womb, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone, causing the omens and the boasters to, of, of boasters to fail making fools out of diviners, causing wise men to draw back and turning their knowledge 
in the foolishness, confirming the, the word of his servant and performing the purpose of his messengers. It is I who, uh, who says to Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah they shall be built, and I will rise up her ruins again. I will raise them up again. Jeremiah chapter 1. In the first chapter here, in the, in the fifth verse. Again, classic go-to verses. No surprises here. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. This is God speaking this about Jeremiah. We can make implications out of this that if God saw this and said this and, demand, and call, created this, formed this of Jeremiah in his mother's womb, is it too far of a stretch that God would cause this, would form this in the womb of all mothers? I mean, it's not too far of a stretch for us to make that. Let's go to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. <clears throat> in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him, let's see, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Okay, let me read it and then I'll decide if I wrote the wrong verse down. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Amen? I wrote the wrong verse down, but that's an amen. Let's read it and shout amen. And then we'll move along. Let's go back to Psalm chapter 102. I'll look later for what verse I was meaning to write down. Psalm 102, 102. <clears throat> yeah, let's let's look at verse 18. There's two words here that I think are of interest. One is the word generation and the other is the word created. Um, in verse 1, this will be written for the generation to come. And the second word of interest here is that created in the second line, that the people yet to be created may praise the Lord. Now this is in a larger um, psalm concerning giving praise to God. And here the psalmist is acknowledging these things are to be so for those who are yet here. So again, implying and obviously scientifically, no one in the scientific world argues that there has to be a starting point of life. There just has to be. Now, I, I'm not a biologist, uh, and I don't play one on a TV program either. So it, it proves quickly that I am not a biologist. But and, and this isn't to bring up the ethical practice of, of, uh, of fertilizing eggs outside of the womb as the scientific world has begun to do but let's at least take the take the scientific glance at this and see there is something that science is identifying whenever they take a sperm and an egg and they fertilize them they're recognizing here is the start now whether they're going to admit that that's what they're doing or not they are they are realizing, notice they're not taking a sperm and an egg and saying, well, we're going to have a 12-week fetus whenever we're done fertilizing this. No, they're saying this is the starting point. Everything else that develops out of this comes from that moment. So scientifically, if we're going to be, and, and we must be a scientifically literate people and then be consistent with our scientific uh, knowledge Obviously, life has begun at the moment of fertilization. So, from that then, should the church, or when should the church speak to the state? Well, 
I don't think we're still ready to answer the question. First of all, let's, let's remind your preacher and let your preacher remind the church. Our primary work is the gospel. There's no getting around this. It is our duty. And if we don't make the gospel our duty, we are out of bounds of what we're created by God to be and to do. We must then begin asking question, who needs the gospel? Every, every one of us needed the gospel and every human needs the gospel. Men who impregnate women need the gospel. Women who get pregnant by men need the gospel. Men who rape women need the gospel. Women who are or in a, in, in a great distressful moment who've been raped and find themselves pregnant, need the gospel. Moms and dads who want to have babies need the gospel. Moms and dads who get pregnant need the gospel. Children that grow up in these homes, in all homes everywhere, need the gospel. So when we, when we say things like this, who needs the gospel? Well, obviously, everybody needs the gospel. Doctors who perform abortions need the gospel. People who work in the offices of these quote-unquote health care facilities need the gospel. Our legislators need the gospel. Government officials need the gospel. So who needs the gospel but everyone? And then, and then perhaps to be germane to the topic then, we will ask the question, who's getting abortions? Uh, well, obviously men aren't getting abortions. So women are getting abortions, which by the way, uh, yeah, I'm learning is one of the places where government officials are saying we need to treat women in a special case because... Um, they're a segment of the population. They're not the whole of the population. In a recent conversation uh, that I had with some government officials, uh, I tried to make the case, listen, uh, it's perfectly legal for me to raise a pig in my backyard, but my city won't let me. Uh, that's probably a bad example, but I went with it and I ran with it. Uh, and the pushback was for this is, yes, that's a law that fits on everyone. This is a law that only addresses a part of the population. And we can't make laws that only impact part of the population. Well, it's a flawed logic uh, it, altogether. But understand the, the complexity of, what's, of what the... It exposes the complexity of this discussion. Because we've become a people who, who give preferences to segments of the population while ignoring the moral or ethical component altogether. We've done the same thing with the LGBT community. Which, by the way, need the gospel. And they need to hear the gospel from a loving people who love their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength. They love their neighbor as themselves. So who's getting abortions? Well, pregnant women, obviously. So that was, that's even uh, um, a, a, an even more extreme segment of the population because not all women are getting abortions, but only pregnant women are getting abortions. And then even further into that is women who are in distress are getting abortions. So that becomes the reason, the rationale behind why we can't make a law that affects only a small percentage of the population. Well, again, that's a flawed, it's an it's a, it's a argument that's made without any moral or ethical connection at all to a holy God. So again, why are, so if we know that pregnant women who are in distress are the ones who are getting abortions, at least that's what the argument will be made back to us. 
Many women in our nation who are getting abortions and around the world are getting abortions purely out of convenience. So there's a lot, there's a lot of pushback inside of the flawed logic of what's being pushed upon us as to why we can't address the matters and why we have to keep our hands off of the topic. So why are they getting abortions? Uh, I didn't cite this research down, so I apologize I can't send you to the research organization that cited these three primary reasons why women are getting uh, abortions. Uh, They're getting abortions out of concern. The number one reason that they give is because of concern or responsibility that there is to another person that they're responsible for, to a baby. Uh, The second reason why they're getting abortions is an inability to afford raising children. Stop and think about that. Every mom and dad who's, who's, been, who's not been born with money, who, who doesn't live with the affluence of money, no child ever comes at a convenient time financially. The third primary reason why, why dis, women in distress are having abortions is because having a baby would interfere with life, which is the convenience issue. It's interfering with work or school, so we don't want to interfere with their pursuit of that will be the rationale. So, obviously it's women who are in distress according to the, to the research and the rationale behind that then uh, raises to the next question then, how then does the church respond to women in those kinds of situations? We must respond to them by telling them the truth that this fetus that is developing in the womb is a person. It's not just a lump of a cell. It is a living person that began at the point of fertilization. We can't just tell them hard, cold facts and expect that to be enough. One would think that that would shock most every one of them, with a conscience anyway. I think we must also be willing to listen to them. I think we really must realize that women are looking for an answer in an unexpected, unplanned scenario that will literally impact their entire life. The church must be a compassionate people about women in this kind of a situation. We really must. We cannot just give cold, hard facts and think that that's enough to give expression of our compassion. We really do need to be kind people. We must respect them as created beings, just like we are. We must must respect women who are searching for an answer to how do I deal with this unexpected, unplanned interruption in my life. We must treat them with a dignity as an image of God-bearing person, just like you and me. So, so how, how then do we talk about this? It is critical. I want to I share some observations. Of, based off of what we know from Scripture, the strength of it here is unquestionable. This fetus in the womb is a living being. It is a person. Uh, We don't need United Nations Declaration to tell us that. We don't need Idaho Code to tell us that. The Bible is very clear. It is a person. So how do we talk about it? This this is really critical. There's there's two things I would want to make observation about in asking the question or answering the question, how do we talk about abortion in this culture? Before we even deal with When should the church speak to the state about the matter? How should we talk about it? This is critical. We we never have permission. There's not anywhere in Scripture that I can build case for that we have permission to ever be caustic or rude about this topic. We never have reason to be caustic, hateful, or mean, rude to a legislator, to a woman at the abortion clinic 
to a conversation we're having on a break at the workhouse. We never have permission to be rude, caustic, hateful. So if we're going to ask, if we're going to answer a question of how do we talk about it, we have to first of all realize that can't be part of our conversation. It can't be part of the way. Doesn't mean we're not bold. Doesn't mean we're not straightforward. It doesn't mean we don't speak factually truthful. But we certainly do not have permission to be caustic or rude in concerning in, in consideration to this matter. So then how do we? If that's how we're not supposed to do it, then how do we talk about it? We must be gracious and respectful. Uh, love, is, lo love is the universally acceptable way to engage people with the gospel. First of all, our, because we love our God. If our love for humanity is ever in front of our love for God, we'll get everything else messed up. Our motivations have to first of all be a love for God. Obe obeying God and His commands. And then loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. Arguments are made and we make these arguments. They, they, we, they work better in the church house than out in the public square because we get this. We understand this. You, nobody in their right mind would walk by a burning building and hearing someone say help you're screaming I'm not going to scream because I'm mic'd here but they're screaming help I need help nobody in their right mind would think that a proper response would be oh they probably need help nobody would even think it would be an appropriate thing to do to walk to the other side of the street and knock on a door gingerly and oh too bad nobody answered the door I guess I can't help them no, the, the right thing to do in, a, in an emergency situation like that is you do all that you can to save that individual. Love is universally attractive. There, there, there is never a time when love is unattractive, when it's, first of all, driven by our love for God and then impacted by our love for our neighbors. Now, it may not be accepted as such, but I think that, it's, that even the secular world understands and gets this. You know, the, the secular world knows the story of the Good Samaritan. They, they don't have, no, nobody has to point them to chapter and verse to tell them of the story of the Good Samaritan. They know this story. The problem is they're applying it outside of their love for God. So they, it gets messy inside of that. But for us then, in this, we must... We must exercise in love and be gracious and respectful when we're encountering difficult individuals and difficult situations. So let's, let's, let's begin to aim to the question, when should the church speak to the state on a matter like this? Um, to, to, again, our only authority that we need is right here. But let's, let's acknowledge that whenever we're engaged in conversation in a government side, we're not necessarily dealing with people that believe the Bible. Uh, when we're in conversations with people at the workplace or in the neighborhood or at the marketplace, uh, we're not necessarily in conversation with people who, who are going to say, you know, you're right, God said it, so obviously it must be true. And so we, we have to be smart thinkers, we have to be careful thinkers, and we have to be consistent with our conversations. One of the things that the world loves to do is say the fetus is not a human, it's a fetus. Well, part of the problem is they're, they're, using, they're not using old dictionaries anymore. Uh, you go get you an old dictionary, look up the word fetus, boom, there it is. Whenever we're talking about the fetus of a human, there's only one way that there can be a fetus in the womb of a human. It would be a human. The fetus in a dog, the only way that that can be possible is that it is the fetus of a dog. The only way an elephant fetus can be in an elephant is because it is an elephant fetus. You have a human fetus. You don't have any other kind of fetus in a human. And so, where I prefer the word human over fetus, I'll go ahead and use the world's language fetus. 
because it actually it helps our argument. It helps the case. You stop and think about it for a minute. What do you call a baby? I've just, I just went ahead and ruined it. For, I gave you the answer. What do you call a baby out of the womb? What do you call a person out of the womb? A baby. Now, a person out of the womb of a human is a human baby. The, the okay, I'm, I'm, I'm lost all of a sudden. I'm not a biologist, I'm telling you. A puppy out of the womb of a dog is a puppy. Right, okay, good. My, that's, that's, the, that's the length of my biology, okay. <laughs> so I don't have any problem calling a human fetus in the womb a fetus. I don't have any problem calling a baby out of the womb a baby. Nor do I have when that same baby begins to walk, I'll call it a what? A toddler. It's still a human, but it's a toddler. Uh, I, I, when, when that toddler grows through childhood and becomes a teenager, they're still a human. Despite all arguments made against the case they're still a human they're a teenager they become a young adult they become a middle-aged adult they become a senior adult they become an old elderly person <laughs> and then they're dead i guess that's just, that's that's just that's the way but they're human at every stage we call them different things all throughout their stages of life so regardless of age or location, whether they're in the womb or out of the womb, it's a person. So, for, for the Christian, for the Bible God-fearing person, we have no problem here of seeing this and understanding this. Uh, a, 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 a scientist by the name of Stephanie Gray for the Center of Bioethical Reform out of Canada Good things do come out of Canada, by the way. She gave a talk recently at Google. As best as I can tell, this was dated 2016. Stephanie Gray, for the Center for Bioethical Reform, brought up a scenario about the slaughtering of children in Rwanda. You remember those horrific that horrific news we began to hear out of Rwanda and the slaughtering of masses of people they began to show pictures of the children in mass graves that have been slaughtered by machetes it's horrible horrific Stephanie Gray made the comparison the similarity and the differences of the slaughtering of babies in the wombs in America. First of all, numerically, there is no comparison. 61 million babies slaughtered in the womb of American women. That's no small thing. One of, the, one of the things that was of most notable difference that she made between the two, the, the butchering of children, the slaughtering of those children with machetes, the difference than the butchering and the slaughtering of children in America, is that the children in Rwanda could run away. Making the slaughtering of the American baby in the womb, unthinkable. The other, the world cries for the inhumane practice, and rightly should. Do you know what would happen in a, in a day if, 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 we were, if we discovered that children outside the womb were being hunted and slaughtered by our government? You realize we would engage ourselves in an underground railroad activity and we would rescue children everywhere. The womb 
It's a different location. We cannot go there and save them the same way we could. This, this makes this of an entirely different kind of cause. So when should the church speak to the state? Well, by the grace of God, I I think the church has been speaking to the state for a long time. The problem is just that we've not been doing it very consistently. We speak about it whenever we're reminded about it, and then we go about our days. We go about our activities. We go about our calendars. We go about our own pursuits. This is no new news for you. We know this. This is not hidden information. The second and fourth Wednesday of every month, a doctor from Oregon shows up in Twin Falls and takes the lives of, in 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 a statistically averaged out statistic, five babies a week. Every other week, so 10 babies every other week are murdered in the city. Twin falls. 20 babies a month. You know, if we heard news of this happening to, to children, there's a rounding up of children, we would find a way. We would do all that we, we would devote our resources to this work. We would build safe houses for these children. We would do whatever it took to save the children. So the simple answer to the question is when should the state, or when should the church speak to the state is uh, obviously right now. Every day. All day. We can't force them to change their mind. But I'm certain of this. They would like for us to go about our business. Go back to our routines. Go back to our calendars. Go back to our busy pursuit of happy, comfortable living. And leave this matter completely alone. I just do not think that we can. So before we even finally give some other thoughts to this I think we have to be willing to ask three more questions are we willing to make our homes available for mothers in distress you see if we're going to if we're going to go to our government and ask them to abolish this atrocious activity are we going to make our homes available If we're not willing to say yes to that, then we have nothing to say. Are we willing to make our homes available for unwanted children? Again, I think if we cannot answer that with a yes, then we really don't have any business in the conversation. Now, I think there's a lot around that question. Because can everyone here literally put children in their homes? Maybe, maybe not. Depending upon circumstances and situations and needs, both of the children and of the household. But one thing is for certain, we can pool our resources to be sure that we have homes and we have places available, safe places, where children can be housed. Listen, if you stop and think about it, we know this, that not all 20 of those babies who are aborted every month in the city of Twin Falls are from mothers in Twin Falls. They come here from all over the region. They come from as far as Idaho Falls, Pocatello, from northern Nevada. They, they, they come. Can you imagine 20 babies? I mean, just take one month. I'm not saying we're the only church that would be willing to do this, but what would, you, what would happen if, if we were able to say to our government, we'll take every unwanted baby 
give them to us, and we'll give them a safe place to live. What are we going to do with 20 babies next month? <laughs> we better do everything that is needed for them. Now, by the grace of God, I think you live in a valley filled with people, good, God-fearing people. This isn't something we have to take on ourselves. But if we're not willing to say in the conversation, we have homes available right now for women who are in distress and they don't know what to do. We have homes available today, right now, for babies that are being born and they are, un they are unwanted. This, this comes primarily out of that 18th verse of Psalm 102. This will be written for the generation to come. That people yet to be created may praise the Lord. When should the church speak to the state? With this kind of mandates from the Scripture, we must be speaking the state and the reason we speak is because it's tied to the gospel now you realize this as well as I do that not every child who's aborted is necessarily going to grow up to be a praiser and a worshiper of almighty God but when the church has put her gospel shoes on and she's entered the battlefield for the lives of of those who bear the image of our Almighty God, we engage in this for the possibility that the unborn may eventually one day praise God. Would not that be a gospel motivation enough for us to go here to do this? All right, well, it seemed like I, have a, I had a more buttoned-up conclusion than just that, but I don't see it on my page. So I guess I'll come back to this then. What, to, to the answer to the question is when should the church speak to the state? It supposes that we should speak to them if we're asking when we should speak to them. We should speak to them when it impacts the gospel. And this is a matter that is tightly related to the gospel. It is inseparable. It is absolutely and necessary that the church speak into this matter. So, by the grace of God, we don't know what's going to come of the current bill. Every indication, uh, it does appear the bill is dead for this session. Uh, apparently they are going to go back to work Monday morning and it may still get a printed bill. Uh, not just for this particular topic, it's because they still have other matters to deal with. Um, if the bill does not get a number this year, then we begin asking other questions. How do then do we go about getting an initiative to put forth for the people well, I don't think there's any mistake. Remember, remember what we learned in Isaiah this morning, that God is in control of everything. Dude, are you aware that your legislators this year just made it harder for the people to put forth initiatives? I think it's, it's probably still up for debate. It's one of the things that they've got to go back and finish discussing, but it's passed one side of the house or the other. It moved from 6% to 10% of the population and it moved from 16 of the counties, 16 of the, you Idaho history people, how, how many counties are there in Idaho? 40, 36, 38? Yes, it moves from 16 counties that you have to have 6%, and it's now to 32 counties that you have to have 10% of the population before something can be considered for an, an initiative. So. If, if this particular bill doesn't work this year, I, I, I'm, I'm here to tell you I can't wait till next year to say, well, somehow the legislators will take this and take care of it. We must at least investigate and, and consider 
what recourses do we have? And then we cannot at the same time wait for the state to make the decisions. I've shared with you already, I've begun the discussions with our city council. Probably sometime within the next week or two, I'll need to have the same conversation with our county commissioners. We know that it is possible to submit code to local jurisdictions or local magistrates. They're not going to write code for us on a matter like this, but we, the people, can write initiatives. And so we'll have to do a good thing and find us a good lawyer. Uh, so by the grace of God, I sat down with a good lawyer on Thursday, and we had a really good conversation. You know this lawyer, pastors the Berean Baptist Church in Wendell, Idaho. Remember what we learned this morning? God is in control. We will wait on him and we will find ourselves and we'll ask him to make us a fit and ready people to act wherever and whenever he leads us to do so. So the church in the meantime, we must continue to pray. Pray that God would move the hearts of our legislative branches. That God would move the hearts of our local authorities. God would even, he even could, grip the heart of our sheriff and shut that building down. That'll have to come from a work of God. You remember what we learned this morning, didn't you? Our God is in control. May he come and help us in the fight. All right, let's pray. So Heavenly Father, again, we, we know we, a big part of how we pray here is that we not lose sight of our love for you. Our duty given to the gospel and our responsibility to a generation that is yet outside the womb. God, that they would find in the course of a, of a culture that continues to move as fast as possible from displaying your glory, may you secure a remnant for the unborn today. I preserve a safe place where the gospel is always heralded, even if the culture doesn't like it. God, for your glory, we submit ourselves to be found usable for you. Come and equip us, direct us, answer our questions. Help us to not be crippled and paralyzed by fear of the words of your enemy. Help us to be mindful that you are in control of all things. And in this, God, to know that you will come and you will one day destroy the great blasphemer. Oh God, for your glory, come and move among us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, you have a question? Comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it statistically, it it is every two weeks that they do it, and so you know this is obviously a to to level it out across the board. Uh, it it comes down to five babies a week. So even though they're here only every other week, it's ten babies every other week, statistically leveled out. So it's two hundred and so you say so you have two hundred and fifty eight babies are murdered in the city of Twin Falls every year. So you just Maybe maybe next week, one's aborted. And maybe the next week, 19 are aborted. And then the rest of the month, nobody's aborted. So it's, it's just a leveled out statistic, if that makes sense. Well, from 10, so five babies a week, or 10 babies every other week, or 20 babies a month. Yeah. 
five babies every week makes ten out of every other week, even though the abortion doctor's only here every other week. The week that they're not here, we're not aborting babies, but just in the averaged number, statistically speaking. Yes. Yes, yeah. yeah. Because it's interesting, there's no doctors around here that will dare do this. Yeah, so bless the Lord. Well, yeah, yeah. The, uh, strangely enough, because of the shortage of doctors who are willing to do this, there, there was legislation this year to try to lower the qualifications. So a, 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 a physician's assistant, if they could have passed this law, could have done the abortions, but this has to be a qualified doctor, medical doctor. No, it, I, I don't know that it, 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 it is not a law, so it didn't get, get passed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably good we don't know that. Because <laughs> that's another thing we'll have to pray about, do we? <laughs> Help us, dear God, not to take justice into our own hands. <laughs>